<laughs> um, can you guys see it? The ancestral healing. And I will attempt because I know the right way to say ancestral healing, but in Michigan, we make up our own words often. And I've always said ancestral, like celestial and ancestral together. And I might slip out. And so I'm just going to apologize in advance. If I say it, you know what I mean? We could even say it's like the celestial ancestral healing, <laughs> but it, it could be something that pops up. And if at any point in time during this call, you get in any way triggered, that's really expected with ancestral type of healing. You may, you may have blips of memories, almost like things popping up out of nowhere when just in talking about it, um, or sudden awareness of something that's been coming up for you. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> better than ancestral healing, but that could come out of my mouth too. We never know with me. Right. Um, and yeah, it was just the other day I said another thing that Jared looked at me and said, what are you talking about? And so we never know. But ancestral healing is, and we're going to talk about this as we get into it, it's all, it's all in us already. We're, we're carrying the memories, we're carrying the fibers. So as we start to learn about it, just the act of awareness can sometimes bring up memories of people you know, memories of people you don't know, memories of feelings in your body. So as we are going through this, <clears throat> write down like, ooh, I'm feeling a tightness in my chest or my knee hurts or anything that pops up and we will get into it. So according to Jen and her angels, right, there's a lot of information about ancestral healing, but the issue comes that you have to be very intentional and aware of the information you're reading. There is a lot of cultural appropriation happening in homes, right? Because over time, every ancient culture had a connection to their ancestors. That's fact. Over time, my internet's coming in and out. Over time, we have lost a huge connection. And so the see almost reach out cultures, African healing, there's a lot of appropriation that goes on. And, and we're going to talk about that as we get through the class. I want to know that you are, it's all with the healing work as a whole and understand you don't have to mimic or appropriate anybody else's patterns of healing it. It will be spoken to you quite quickly. Right. And, um, when, when you get into some of the stuff we're going to talk about anywhere you are from, whether you've done your DNA test or you're just going off of what your stories that, that your family has shared, we all have a past with connection, connecting to our ancestors. So the act itself is not going to be a cultural cultural appropriation, but do it in a way that feeds your soul and you'll unlock things really quickly, right? If you're trying to tap in using somebody else's method that's based off of a culture that is not yours, you might feel stuck in the mud, right? I'm really breaking up. Has it gotten any better? It, it, it gave me a warning that it was weak, but then it seemed to pick back up. Is it better now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. If it gets bad again, let me know. And I can always stop and try to switch my, my um, Wi-Fi. Because that'll, that'll get annoying. <clears throat> okay. So, oh, I want to go back to that. Eesh. Okay. So the three different ways, according to the massive amount of meditation I've <laughs> done with my angels and books and things like that as well. But there's levels to it. And you will find that as you tap in, you will reach into different levels depending on where your first journey into the ancestral healing it pulls you. So generational, th we're thinking about that as actual generations, stories gathered and passed on. This, this is more also um, healing of the natural world, things that actually happened in the physical realm to ancestors that you know the names of. It's one of the things that you might want to use as a um, 
differentiating fact, right? So if you know the name or you know that was my mother's grandmother, sometimes this comes up in energy work, right? So it's maternal, your grandma, your grandma's grandma, that's going to be generational healing. Um, and that you will also see that there's a growth pattern and a trajectory over time. So generational healing, you will see that there's almost like a grand story arc and you're part of it. You can heal it. You bring it forward. It's almost like it's part of the same book, right? It doesn't need to be its own separate book or its own volume or anything like that. It's, it's part of the same, same story arc. So, um, a for instance would be if somebody's generational maternal grandmother survived the witch trials, oppression being called out, being um, singled out, hunted down, that could be a theme over many generations. And then you bring healing to it and you heal all past generations, right? So that's more of the generational healing that we tend to talk about. Generational healing will also be applicable to any sort of shattered psyche from the industrial revolution. So if you are generationally from a community that worked closely with the land, but in that the industrial revolution put you into factories, that sh sort of shattered um, daily environment that happened quickly. There's this concept in sociology, right? Called the, conti the continuum concept that we're evolving faster than, you know, communities tend to naturally evolve over time. Like you learn a new tool and then everyone learns a new tool and then something new comes in and then everyone learns it. The industrial revolution kind of started to introduce concepts at a pace that our DNA doesn't keep up with well. And so generational traumas can occur over no longer working on farms, no, no longer um, being with nature, no longer hunting, no longer gardening, right? Those kind of day-to-day -day things, those get gathered up in the generational type things. And oftentimes, if you are dealing with some sort of um, mental illness, that seems generational. Um, we can get into the DNA of it also, but it can be from that shattered psyche, right? And if it, it's like, oh, all the women in my life um, or all the women in my family have such and such issue, but actually it started in the 50s or it started in the 30s, right? Or, and there was really no talk of it before then. Sometimes that's going to be a generational thing, not genetically linked. So when we get into the genetic, we're talking DNA linked, we're talking actual like epigenetics, trauma turned on genes that then get expressed and passed down in the expression. Those are gonna be different because oftentimes we do not know the names. Um, and I'll get into some of our curiosities that bring those names into our awareness, like ancestry.com, right? So we can learn the names, but it's not something that's been passed to us, it's more like in our body. Some of the things, Things you'll get into when you start to focus on the genetic ancestral healing. And I do recommend you go in this order when you start. You start with your generational ancestral healing, then you move to genetic, then you move to cellular. Um, yes, yes. And a lot of, oops, a lot of cultural scarcity, like you're saying, Sean, is really linked to that as well. Um, but the, with the genetics, like the DNA sequencing, right? Um, we also will find that there's things in our DNA that are linked to places our generational families may have never been, right? So if you're from Ireland, if you've got a lot of DNA from Ireland, your genes are linked to the seasons of your homeland, right? And you don't understand it. Your grandma's grandma was never even there, but yet you feel the call, right? So that's going to be generational healing and generational support ancestors are going to be linked to that DNA and to the land itself because it's going to support different DNA to trigger into place. Some of the other things I feel come up when I do genetically linked ancestry, right, are fun things that start to bring certain ancestors forward. Maybe you realize you have exceptionally long fingers and then an ancestor that was a weaver of cloth will come forward right? Or um, some sort of craft or some sort of ability where the, that kind of DNA was supported. Or you'll find, <clears throat> you know, maybe that you have an ancestor that's trying to come through. Sorry, they're really trying to come through about somebody's ancestor was a fisher, 
fisherman. So you find yourself at the sides of rivers and bodies of water, feeling like you're just going to rip these fish out with your bare hands, like that kind of an energy. Those things can be in our DNA. They're triggered up by similar situations through epigenetics and thought patterns and things like that. <clears throat> so cellular ancestry, that's the cosmic dust. And if this is unfamiliar to you, you have to get into some more of the raise your frequency stuff where we talk about our energy and what is energy. We are actually made of stardust. We're made of all these different chemicals. And just like nothing in nature can truly be destroyed, it just changes. We carry that actual cellular memory of the star systems we came from, of the solar system clouds from the exploded stars to the trees, you know, anything, anything we happen to be made of. When you start to give, get deeper into your psyche, you'll realize there's a, a energetic connection to the things you're made of. And sometimes you'll have wild memories. Um, and one of the funny things is that Olive, when she was like two and a half, she told us that she loved being a whale. She tries to be a whale as often as she can. And that the last time she was here, she was a whale, but she couldn't be a whale this time. They wouldn't let her. And we always thought that was really funny, but she still says things like that. Like, I can't wait to get into the water. And I'll say, cause you're a whale. <laughs> it's a long joke. So my internet's unstable. I'm going to give it a minute to correct itself. Let me know if it's okay. Thumb up, thumb down. I guess I'm okay. All right. So, so the industrial industrialization of our souls. This is one of the things that I think has hurt the, the human nature um, or humanity as a whole more than anything else because we didn't get to bring with it the spiritualism that we had before. Um, and as we started to move further from the land and further from the campfires and further from, even, even if you think about um, how people would get together and work the land together, they would cook together, they were spending more time together. Um, those kinds of things have shattered. And so the talking of our loved ones is fewer and farther between. And that's how we really can bring our ancestors into the modern day is talking about them. And con you know, that's where that saying came from. Oh, that conjures up a thought, right? You really are bringing it into the now when you talk about them and you're helping them heal, not just yourself. I love this graphic. Um, the ancestor deficit disorder, right? When you are disconnected from where you have came from, right? You will find that you are constantly feeling low. You feel a lack of wonder. You, you might feel like you don't really understand your path forward. And I get this a lot in energy work, right? More my clients will say some of these things, but there's almost like a resignation that I guess this is life, right? The magic, the mysticism of everyday life starts to be disconnected. And so as you look through those, you'll start to see the purpose of ancestral healing. It is one of the, the most nurturing healings that you will ever do. Um, and one of the most instantly gratifying, I will almost bet that you will start to feel almost instant joy the minute you start to recognize that you have ancestors all around you. You're just not connected to them. Um, so spiritual um, medicine versus mechanistic. So back before the Renaissance, when physicians and people studying the body and illness and wellness and all of all all the things, they understood that there was a spirit in everything. There's a spirit in the flower. There's a spirit in this plant. Um, it's where you hear different um, dispositions, you know, like a weaker disposition, a stronger disposition. Um, that kind of language was used more. Everything was being used together. Um, if someone was sick, were they in an argument? right? Like those kinds of things were always thought about. This is not new. So things like you can heal your life with Louise Hay, the affirmations and the very technical things might be similar, but way back when there was this spiritual underlining um, 
vision of wellness and we were more connected to the spirit we were more connected to our loved ones that had passed on things like that through the renaissance it became more mechanistic more like machines we were looked at as just the the flesh and bone and the electricity within. We were not really seeing the spirit when it comes to medicine. It's slowly starting to reintegrate, but you guys all know it's pretty, pretty, <laughs> it's pretty shallow. It's like a tree without roots. You have to be doing both um, on your own. So I always think like when I look at this picture, I almost feel like modern medicine is the tree and ancestral work, energy work, you know, essential oils. It's all the roots that tie us into why we're here. And it's important to be aware of it as we move. And we have all this modern day ancestral healing that's happening even without us calling it what it is, right? Ancestry.com is one big healing center. I find myself constantly clearing energetic lines. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys do this on your ancestry, but I'm clearing trauma, clearing this. Um, a new distant cousin will pop up on my thing and I'm like, Ooh, okay, we're going to clear some new level of connection. will start to pick up. I'm fascinated by it. As you learn names of ancestors you never knew about, you will instantly start to for, find that you have a connection still. And we'll get to why that is. Um, the human genome product project. This is all this modern curiosity into where did we come from? What did we bring with us? What is there still within us that links us back to the olden, olden days, right? What are we bringing like the research where Holo Holocaust survivors, great, great, great grandchildren showed the same trauma um, markers in their DNA, even if they never suffered any palpable trauma themselves. So this is all things that people are aware of. And with the uprising of things like Reiki and energy work, we're doing timeline healing often that is involved with ancestry, right? And the mediums, psychics, it's a big business now, right? Because people want to know who's on the other side, who's talking to me, who leaves feathers in my bedroom, who's dropping dimes in my kitchen, right? Like we're getting the signals, but we're not making the connection and the whole world wants it. Okay, so this brings, I liked this image. I wanted to bring it. I don't necessarily want to say like these things are things I believe as well, but this is, this is stuff you'll bring up and you'll see as you research ancestral work. Um, different societies, different cultures will see it differently. Some cultures believe that your family line will continue to work things out to clear karmic blockages. Some religions believe that you will carry curses until somebody can clear it, right? Some people will bring with them, um, they will set an intention that all of their future lineage will carry something forward. They have a purpose. Like our, each of us have a divine path. I, I believe this to be true as well. I'm going to not mince words here that a lot of us that came to the new world for, for this promised land, we have that in our DNA. And some of it is releasing the pressure to fulfill the hopes and dreams that our ancestors didn't get to fill. And because they couldn't ever have dreamed up a world for us here, that is the way it is now, right? And so sometimes that's the block to moving forward is the hopes and dreams of an ancestor that has almost planted that seed into their DNA and their future generations. Um, and and it is hard sometimes I'm seeing in the questions, Annie, there, it is hard to trace blood ancestors. I know I'm adopted on one side and I thought ancestry would bring up something <laughs> and it didn't. <laughs> um, and so it can really kind of, you feel almost like, oh, will I ever know that side? And so it can get frustrating. Um, one of the things that I did find healing about ancestry.com was that it at least tells you the DNA you're carrying and you're um, expressing, right? So in leading some of the healing to my, to the land, that's what I'm finding a lot of connection to. So as we move forward in the rest of the class, we're going to really talk a bit more about why this healing work isn't just about us, right? We're also healing them over on the side. It says, a mutually beneficial relationship with their ancestors. I've talked about this a very little bit, 
you guys know that I have some mediumship type gifts that I don't like to talk about, but some of these things will come up whenever you're doing the work. There are four main principles and these stay pretty solid along all cultures that have connections to ancestors and that routinely practice bringing ancestry into their daily life. Four main things. The first one, I say life continues into the next room. That is Wayne Dyer, right? He talked about that all the time, that when we leave this world, it's like we go to the next room. We're not gone. We're always here. We maybe can't always hear each other. We can't see each other with our eyes. We know we're there. Sometimes we can hear each other and we can send messages, but we're never gone. Um, that's one of the foundational principles to understand is that every ancestor that you will ever need will be right where you are and they can come very close after passing on the dead continue to heal right sometimes we believe that it's this instant restoration but depending on the things that they've carried through life and what their lessons are i've had many spirits tell me that they're still working with god on some things that happen in this life right and say my my internet connection is unstable if you at all feel triggered during this conversation, it's hard to listen to. It's okay. You don't have to shut down the internet. No, <laughs> um, but they will continue to heal, continue to gain these lessons, continue to sort of process what went on in life. And that can be especially true if there was a significant amount of trauma in this life. Um, if they were significantly um involved in many people's lives. It's almost like a life review, right? And so sometimes we want to see someone who has passed on immediately after they've passed on. We want to know that they're there, but they're not necessarily available yet. Um, and they, when they become more available and more healed, that they will show up right? As soon as they're capable, they will. So if you're not seeing them, it's probably because they're still working on some things and healing on the other side. And so um, some confirmations in the messages from Jackie there. Yeah, it's, it's something that I know I didn't necessarily expect or fully understand until it was shown to me in a couple different visions that it just kind of heals. Um, Sean, there are seasons where this will come up more than others and we're in it with the retrogrades and the eclipses. A lot of time ancestry will come up around that because first of all, um, first of all, that meme, I really got to stop saying first of all, but I'm going to not <laughs> uh, giggle to myself. Um, but first of all, there are these patterns that almost every ancestor like ancestral lineage can trace back where the traditional people in all ethnicities, Celtic, everywhere, right? Not far back, ancient Egypt, you know, Rome, Greece, everywhere. Paid attention to the moon, right? To the eclipse seasons, to the solstice, things like that. There was always this grand celebration or this, you know, reverent pra practice throughout our DNA. It's going to be a time where you are easy, easily linked. Does that make sense? You will find a connection, especially if you're trying to dig into a very specific lineage. Um, and so there is there, I've worked with people who had a very strong Egyptian lineage and it would come up constantly in meditations, the Egyptian imagery and right around solstice time, summer solstice, which was big um, for Egyptians. That it, it would be easier, almost like Stargate stuff, right? Like, so you're getting into different areas where it's going to be more enhanced and the veils become a little bit thinner uh, and it will come up a lot during retrograde season. Um, the third principle is that communication is always open 24 seven. So sometimes we think like, um, that they're going to be around more at night. That's not true, right? Um, it's just that you're quieter at night or that there are certain times that, you know, they won't help you, right? I've heard people say things like, you know, I've been asking, but they're not showing up. Usually they are, but the signs are not exactly what you've asked for and you've got to get a little bit more open, but they can always hear, especially if it's a recent loved one and you feel like you're calling out to them and they're not coming. 
um, that's passed on, it's usually just because they can't yet, but they can hear you, right? So you wanna understand that that communication is usually always open. And then the other thing is we impact each other passively and actively, meaning when we heal, they heal. When they heal, we will heal. And when we actively engage with them to heal together, we'll go farther, both sides farther. Um, when I talk to those who have passed on, I do not have to always do it out loud, although I did in the beginning, for me, I think, um, before I learned how to, it's a kind of a, that makes me sound super woo when I say, I, before I learned how to project into the quantum field, I would have to speak out loud, but that's, that's kind of another A little bit, we should do a lot. Understand things happen on different realm. Almost is helpful. Designing my DNA. Uh, this is what it's gonna feel like as you move through this. Breaking up again. Sorry. Oh, now it warns me that I'm unstable. Okay. Oh, I can always tell when I'm frozen because I tell jokes and no one laughs because I'm so funny and dependable. Okay, you're back. <laughs> can everyone hear? Yeah. Um, I was just reading this to you guys. I thought it was funny. I said it in a Valley Girl voice, but I must have cut out. The internet didn't think I was funny. Um, <laughs> what I feel like this is going to, this is what it feels like, you know, shadow work can be one of those things where you're like, oh, I'm so excited to dig into this. And then you get there and then you're like, oh, why did I dig into this? Kind of the same, same with ancestral healing is except for usually the pain, it comes from not being ready to accept things as they are, right? So maybe when you're connecting to an ancestor, especially if it's somebody that's you know, passed on or <clears throat> that you feel like you wish you would have gotten to know more, you have a stronger connection to wanting more. And so sometimes that can show up as a little bit of suffering for us because of the separateness. And so just kind of paying attention to what your emotional attachments are when you are doing the work. If you feel like it's bringing up too much, you need to stop. You're not ready for it right? Um, because it really should be healing and uplifting in almost every way, except for when you're, except for, and I'll get to that, when you get to curses, hooks, and toxic connections. Um, this is the process. This does not change. You will go into it more in depth. You will, you can be very surface. The way that this will process and the way that it will feel almost every time that you work with your ancestry is going to come in these waves. You will set the initial prayer, invite, intention based on your belief systems, right? Based on your awareness and understanding of how close they are. It will look different for everybody. This is where you really create the boundaries, right? This is where you kind of set up the tone. I want to invite my ancestors to come with me on my journey of healing. I understand we're connected. Um, I would like to work together, right? And then atonement. So what I say in atonement, meaning you want to transmute any fear you have to this process and to love, any anger you have towards your ancestors, you want to transmute that somehow into love and you want to work to make things right. So if you're working with healing an ancestral line that has a lot of abuse, right? You're wanting to bring love into that line. Being angry and, and fighting with your ancestors is not helpful, right? Understanding it as best you can and bringing love to it so that everyone can heal is really going to be the goal. Understanding and bringing grace, right, into the situation is going to help you heal that. Then the requesting for communication. You really want to be specific. If I'm really tapping into great grandma energy from such and such, whatever. I'd like to see something blue, blue butterfly, blue flowers, blue what, 
show me that we're, we're on the same level and that I'm getting this right. Because sometimes when we're inviting ancestors in, um, we're very eager. And I joke about this all the time that some of you will show up to energy calls with like 10 ancestors in the room because you were talking with your family and all these different memories came up and that just brings everybody around. And that's how it's supposed to be. Most cultures will sit and talk about their ancestors. When we lived in Arizona, we were very close to the Mexican border and it was so common there. Every week they set a place for a different deceased member of the family, the day of the dead celebrations, all these different ways of incorporating ancestors and bringing the healing into the current, right? And so you really wanna ask for these signs and interactions. Um, when I say address curses, hooks, toxic connections, all of those things are definitely going to be related to trauma in some way. And it's not that there's a current bad thing happening to you because of your ancestors, but because the, the base of those things is intention. So let's say somebody passed and there was a lot of anger between family members, right? The cousin hated the brother, hated the uncle, hated like fights like that when they pass on, those are the things that they're going to be healing. If you tap into that, you can help release those things, right? You can help to clear them in the same way we clear them in the living. And then the last thing is you're going to want to free them from us. So if you have hooks into them, if you guys were around when I told the story about my grandpa coming to me in a dream and saying, you've got to let me go now, you're okay, right? It's my time, I've got to go heal and you've got to let me go. Sometimes we hang on to people and the stories and we don't let them shift. And so you just want to make sure you're cutting yourself from that. <clears throat> Here are some tips, right? Um, create boundaries for you, um, mostly for you. Usually ancestors have great boundaries. They're with God, right? They're doing the work that they have to do and we're not controlling them or manipulating them. You want to make sure that you're not like, you know, I can't find my keys ancestors, right? Like, you know, I, I believe you can call forward your ancestors at any point in time, but you really want to be using that, um, you know, use your angelic support for that, <laughs> and like the fairies and stuff. Ancestors will show up and surround you in all times. And there are some of the most powerful healings I've done and received are when ancestry, ancestors have been called in to support the release of something, something that we've all been dealing with throughout time and history and the ancestral support shows up behind you and you know it and it's big. It's ever all that energy coming together. Um, one of the tips also is to choose an area to focus on first. So in the same way that you would go through ancestry.com, you can't study all lines at the same time. You know, you kind of want to dig through and chase one trail as far as you can and then pick another one. Um, get into the habit of asking the ancestors to show up in your meditations and communicating with them in your natural environment, in your natural habitat, right? You don't have to begin a whole new practice for this. Just start being aware of what's coming out um, and what's coming up. Another thing is to the, release the need to know names and connections. Sometimes we will get someone that comes to us in a meditation and we feel like, oh, this is like a great grandmother somewhere. We will impede the process of the gifts they're trying to give us, of the help they're trying to give us. If we're like, no, really, are you from Aunt Nancy or Aunt Lorraine? Like, I got to figure this out. Like, who were you married to? You know, were you Catholic, Protestant? Which were you, right? You want let, to let it go a little bit. Those things don't matter as much once people have passed on, right? So let it not matter as much to you. Sometimes names will come through super fast if it's important to you through a medium because it will help you get the message clearer. But when it's coming directly to you, oftentimes people won't be like, I'm JC, right? It just doesn't matter. They don't care. They're here for a message, for support, for an energy line. So kind of let that go. And then become aware, signs, interactions everywhere. If a moth flies into your face, if a butterfly lands on your foot, if a dragonfly looks like it winks at you, those things, just take it seriously, write it down, use it um, as confirmation. And then the, this one is major. Um, do not ignore the oppression, colonization, wrongdoings of your ancestors. Help them heal it. That's what they're there for, right? 
oftentimes ancestors show up because they want to say, we did this wrong and you're carrying the energetic connections to it still, release it, right? Sometimes they show up to say, um, you know, this is something I created in our DNA. And as, as you set about healing it, you will then release the ancestors that were complicit in that. And so really allow it. Um, Katie asked in the comments, how do you decide in angels versus ancestors? Just circumstance. Sometimes things feel big and connected to lineage, specifically with my daughters, right? As they've come into their, I call it their witch age, right? At 13, as they come into that like spiritual knowingness sometimes things come up and I'm like oh I'm pretty sure I said that at 13 and I'm pretty sure my sister did and my mom did and that feels more like a five we call it figal blood um that's a figal blood issue right and so we'll kind of call in ancestors in, in that way angels are definitely more like that ever present constant support type stuff um yes frozen two that is that was a, why I decided to talk about this now I watched frozen two and thought <gasps> The world's ready for ancestral healing. Yes, <laughs> that was one of my main things. I was like, I got to teach that because I always feel quite weird talking about this, to be completely honest with you. But Frozen 2 was like a primer, man. Sean just said to me, you just are watching this? <laughs> like, um, But I, I, we didn't see it until recently and I was watching it and I kept telling the girls, that's real life, you know, that's really how that works, you know, and we were, we were joking. That's really how it works. Your ancestors want you to heal things, right? They want you to bring what they were trying to do into reality and they're willing to help you because they know they messed up. Right. And so there's not even messed up, but they didn't have awareness like we do now. And so then just like you will one day be an ancestor. There's a great shaman that teaches um, ancestor training courses. Those are funny, right? <laughs> like how to, how to make it so that you're a good ancestor going forward and people don't have to do a ton of timeline work on your life. Um, but <laughs> kind of like stepping into that awareness that we, are, we have a lineage and we have a legacy and, and, and we're carrying that forward. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the frozen too because that the whole time, it's like so seriously how it works. Um, Hmm. Another thing is that fear comes up often, especially when it's a person that may have hurt you or hurt somebody in your life and they show up in a meditation and it's kind of like, oh, that's bad. Oftentimes they're there because they're going to help you with the key. They've got the key. They hurt the person. And how I tend to see this in the energy world, if you ever see it, you don't have definitely see what comes up for you. But I'll see generational curses is what I call them as locks on energy systems, right? And so if you're ever doing an energy session and you feel like you have a lock, like you can see like almost like a, like an actual lock, like a bike lock, um, I will say who has the key to the ancestors, right? And usually an ancestor will come up and that lock is connected to something they did that is in the generations that needs healing. Um, so that's one of the things to really understand that fear is not always a block. Sometimes it's a super highway to healing, right? But to use the discernment in the moment, do you need to clear a curse or do you need to unlock something? They're both gonna trigger up that same kind of moment of hesitation. The last one is do not limit the possibilities, especially when you start to dig deeper into cellular ancestral healing you will have wild visions. You will be on butterflies and other galaxies. You'll be in star systems far, far, far away. You'll be talking with your brain. Um, and posted that video of those two girls talking telepathically. And I told her it felt like my brain was like, this is how it works. Like my whole brain wanted to just stop using my voice for the rest of my life. Like there was like this funny awakening that just kind of is so powerful. Um, yes. And then that is, but that is also, I just saw it in the comments, but don't limit the possibilities, allow the visions to come. And then you can use discernment later. But if you try to get into, when you're opening up and you're like, I'm ready for healing, symbolism is often used for when you don't have language. So if you start blocking symbolism, because it seems crazy to you, 
you'll block the symbolism, you'll block the language, and then you're, and then it stunts, it stunts it. So you want to just be open to the symbolism um, and you can use the discernment and dig through what it might mean later. And yes, um, Anne asked if anyone who has abused the person I'm working on will step forward in that lineage. That happens more often than someone who's helped. And it's the unfortunate work. I think that a lot of people that have the medium gifting struggle with is that someone comes and they really do hope to talk to a certain person and then it's the person that hurt them that comes forward first um because that's where the healing is that's the person that can you know um make it right the most and so sometimes it's not the time to share about it um but that can be that's hard yeah and no and no one wants to talk to that person but that's the super highway right? That's the moment you you do, then oftentimes you can get through to another breakthrough, right? And um, a different connection that really shows up, like just completely differently. Okay, so I included in this because I'm going to share these slides with you guys, just some different prayers that you can open up. Um, one of my Reiki friends, she has a whole Thing that she prays before she does a Reiki session and she brings all her ancestors that have ever had the healing gifts into her sessions with her. The way that you decide to call your ancestors forward can be very long. It can be very short. It's your intention, right? That matters more than anything, but just some of the language that can really kind of come together I don't want to read it to everybody because we do have a group session to get into. And these are graphics that I can share in our group as well. Um, yes, there might be a lock, Beth. We'll talk about that. Um, this one I love so much. It's so short. Ancestors within me, wild and free, guide and protect me for eternity. I'm like here for it. I love short things that rhyme because... I have a really shoddy memory when it comes to memory things. Um, I like when you connect to the fact that not only are we being blessed by ancestors, but we're also made of the same materials as our ancestors. And if you read the book one that I'm constantly reading to you guys from, like it are connected simultaneously, right? And how time is spread out and nonlinear. It says I cut out. I don't know if you heard me. Um, but when we work with our ancestors, this one here is the one that always hits me when you really think about it, that they're your eyes on the other side, right? They're your eyes on this side. Ancestors are always able to support you because they are you. And, and depending on how you want to get into this and depending on how you want to make these connections, um, one of my favorite songs is exactly by Amy Steinberg. Um, it came out a long time ago, but there's this part where she says, if you look at me close enough, you'll see you, right? We're all in each other. We're all made of the same stuff and we're all that divine spirit. We are all God. We're all made of this beautiful building material. And when you start to really open up to the awareness that we're all connected and that the connection never stops it makes perfect sense that we would be able to access our ancestry at any time, right? Because we're always connected energetically, always. Um, and so what book? Did I say book? My favorite song? Uh, did I mention a book? I can, you guys can unmute as we move into question time and then I can answer it there. I do have two book recommendations, <laughs> but I hadn't said them yet, I don't think. So I was like, um, but I will tell you if at any point in time you thought I sounded crazy, my book recommendations are not going to make you feel any better. <laughs> They're way more words to talk about. So um, <laughs> one of them is ancestral medicine, and um, the other one is ritual, power, healing, and community. And I'll post the, the, names and authors to those in the cosmic toolbox but um you will Jenna, i find... thought you said the book one. Oh, go ahead joanna oh i thought you said the book one i mean i'm just coming in towards the end but i thought you said the book one. Oh, i did say that about yeah one and i referenced a lot <laughs> 
yeah, <laughs> I forgot I was talking about that book. Um, That's it's, what I heard. I just wanted to make sure I heard it because it flipped out at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, I'm like, what book? I wasn't talking about any book, but I, I, yeah, no, one, one is the book that I've read probably in like five different cosmic sessions. And I always feel like I'm the worst person ever because when I was in a play group in Tucson, um, I was a younger mom, right? I was 25 when Kira was one. And I met this woman at the park and she was 47 and had two children. And she was like, you should come for a play date at our house one time. And I'm like, okay. And she wanted to read to me. Like the kids went off to play in another room and she was reading Dr. Seuss to me. And I didn't understand what was happening. And I was trying to like get out of the house. She was like, these are some of my favorite Dr. Who's books ever. And I'm like, oh my God, why are you reading to me right now? I've got to go, right? And um, I went home and Jared was like, you just sat there and let her read to you? I'm like, what would you have done? <laughs> and I still don't know why she read to me. And I'm still friends with her. And I, we joke about it all the time. She's like, I don't know, I was nervous. But yeah, she read to me. And so now every time I read to an adult, I'm like, is this okay? Um, <laughs> is this okay if I read this to you? Yes. And Black Panther, all of the, the eyes on the other side and the Panthers in the tree. Black Panther is such a good book too. Um, but one is actually Jackie recommended I buy that. I'm looking around. I've got like three copies. Jonathan uh, Livingston. Jonathan. Richard Bach is his name. Jonathan Livingston Seagull is another book he wrote. Is another book that he wrote. Yes. Richard Bach. And it's yeah. one and there's like a circle. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. I've read it a million times and it's like, um, it's so good. And that's, yeah, read it. <laughs> and then um, I'm going to do the energy session before we do Q&A so that um, anyone that has to hop off isn't here for too long. But I wanted to... Make sure that everyone understands because we were talking about the ancestry stuff, you may have that come up in your clearing. It will automatically come up. If I get any notes, I'll write it down for you privately and send it to you afterwards. Um, any pressing questions or anything before we start the clearing? I got everyone's text that texted me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, Beth. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Katie. I had a really, really bad headache after doing a week of doing a lot of shadow work. Yes. Okay. Shadow work headaches are common with shadow work, but we'll try to clear that um, as part of this. I'm going to send you a private message afterwards. I just. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like picking up on other things. All right, let's start the session. We'll clear that. I'll write that down so I don't forget. And then um and then we'll hop back on and do the QA afterwards.